Okay, in this session, we're looking at food and fiber as a context um, for the learnings in technologies education as part of design and technologies as a subject. So we're going to look at the food and fiber production aspect, the food specialization um, sub aspect, <laughs> and the key considerations and the processes of production skills involved in teaching food and fiber as a context and the product services and environments that students will be creating as part of their learning around food and fiber. So let's get into it. So there's two aspects of design and technology, technologies and society and technologies context and food and fiber. Well, let's go on. Um, food and fiber production and food specializations are done as a combined um, context in years one to four and also in years five and six, actually. Um, so in, in, in the primary years, they're, they're all done together. There's just one context, but we have this um, hyphenated name for it. So there's a number of things that students need to learn in their learning about food and fiber uh, production and um, the food specializations. First is that we need food and fiber to sustain our lives. Um, obviously, we need food to live, but we also need fiber for clothing and not so much accommodation anymore, but certainly at once upon a time, we used to have to make our own um, buildings. Uh, but now fiber is primarily focused around clothing. There are various resources that students need to learn about, the physical resources, but also financial, social, and environmental resources that are involved in food, food and fiber production, particularly around sustainability, um, around sustainable land, and also water management, which is an increasingly significant aspect of food and fiber production. They need to learn about the science and technologies that are involved in this um, and how it supports food and fiber production and how it's important for our economy, that the Australian economy is based primarily on uh, primary industries, um, which include food and fiber production. And there's also a whole lot of people that are employed in food and fiber production um, and how their needs and careers and opportunities are important, but they also open up possibilities for your students to pursue careers in those fields. Okay, so in the actual um, descriptions that students need to address, or you need to address, so that students need to learn, um, the first is in food and fiber production, food specializations, is for years one and two. Um, and this is around how students need to explore how plants and animals are grown for food, clothing, and shelter. So we start off with most of these um, Aspects looking at how our indigenous communities have traditionally exploited food and fiber and plants um, for food, but also, well, in this case, for food. Um, looking at how they look, as an example, they could look at how um, First Australians used various techniques for gathering plants and animals for food and fiber production. Um, there are the terraces that were used in the Torres Strait. I couldn't actually find a picture of those, but these are terraces used in um, Southeast Asia. But there's also uh, fire farming or fire hunting um, and also various ag agricultural um, approaches. Uh, quite locally here in Southeast Queensland, there was quite an extensive uh, farming of mangrove worms as a food source. Students could also look at identifying various plants and animals that provide food and materials for clothing and shelter. What are the best foods for, what are the best plants for food? Why are some plants good for food, some plants not good for food? Why are some plants good for making shelters and clothing, but not all plants? So these are things that students could explore in the early years. 
Um, they could also look at how different plants and animals are better suited for different environments. In our tropical north, we grow things such as um, bananas and yams and tropical um, um, plants and animals. While in the south, we have different um, animals and plants. And in the desert areas, again, different animals and plants to our coastal areas. So the idea that it's not uniform where we gather our animals and plants from. Um, there are certain areas that are better suited for them than others. And why is that the case? And students can explore that. Students could identify um, the different products that are made from animals and plants. So from a particular product, let's say paper, where does it come from? Um, if we have a, a jumper, where does it come from? Is it a woolen jumper? Does it come, where does wool come from? These approaches that students can then explore looking back on the supply chain of where we actually gain the resources from for the everyday food and clothing items that they utilize. They can also look at the tools that are used in um, the production of these plants and animals. Uh, so looking at the various tools used on a farm uh, through the very simple ones that they would be familiar with, such as spades and rakes and um, shovels and things of that nature, all the way through to more complex um, tools such as irrigation pumps and cultivators and mechanical tools, uh, backpack sprayers for spraying uh, pesticides, um, seed drills for drilling into the soil to plant the seeds. There's a whole plethora of tools used in the um, agricultural industries that could be explored. So take a break now, have a look at the first of our little video clips. This one looking at Australian bush tucker. Um, there's lots of examples of how we can gather food and plants from, um, well, sorry, food and fibres from local indigenous um, knowledge of the Australian resources available in our local environments. So have a look at that and then we'll come back and continue our journey looking at various aspects of food and fiber production. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a little bit of an example. Now there's lots of opportunities, lots of video clips, but also opportunities to bring in locals with um, knowledge, particularly indigenous um, locals that can explain various resources that are available in the local community if not indeed the local school grounds. Um, if you've got a fair amount of still native vegetation in your school grounds, um, going and actually finding out what foodstuffs are available there or in the nearby bushlands. Oops. So then in years one, we also look at the um, how food can be selected and prepared for healthy eating. Now this relates to the food specialization um, subcategory. So how we can actually support and promote healthy eating is a big part of the design and technology subject and digital technologies curriculum. So the first is students should be able to identify what is healthy foods versus unhealthy foods. And the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating is a resource that's available and used a lot in schools that helps identify not just what are healthy and unhealthy foods, but the fact that we need to have a selection of foods from a range of food groups to maintain a healthy diet. Um, and there are a range of resources that can help with that, but this is one that students can utilize to explore that aspect of healthy eating. Another approach you could have is looking at comparing different uh, food foods used in different countries. So for example, comparing how um, families and students in Asian countries prepare and source their foods and what they eat compared to what happens in Australia or what happens in Europe or South America or various other locations. So looking at the idea that food isn't uniform, different, um, different members of your own school community will eat different meals 
um, different foods at different meals. Why is that the case? How does culture impact upon our food choices? How does that then potentially impact upon diet? There's also a healthy food guide for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, and comparing the, the guides for um, Indigenous students versus um, overall Australians can be another approach um, that could be explored and looked at. Again, looking at that idea that food can be culturally um, embedded and that different cultures and different groups and different families and different students will eat different foods because of their different cultural interests and backgrounds. Another aspect that students can explore is supermarkets and food distribution um, locations such as websites uh, and the idea that they are set up to help firstly help us find the food and locate and gather the food but also to advertise the food how various advertising techniques are used and whether or not that impacts upon healthy eating choices um, and these things can be considered in their ex exploration of where we get food from and how we choose food that is healthy for us Uh, students can also look at the different ways of preparing foods, uh, particularly if you've got a school garden and how students can take the uh, raw resources and turn them into various uh, prepared food items, um, such as drying food or uh, roasting food or steaming it or making it into a salad and how it might affect the taste and texture of the food, which then affects how, um, how much we like eating that food. Okay, then in years three and four, we again look at ways of producing food and fiber. So again, looking at how different um, indigenous groups have um, been able to farm and um, irrigate and weed and crop and store and trade various food items. Looking at how that can be done in their own local environment, such as the school how they can create gardens, or chicken pens. Um, they could design various gardens or chicken enclosures or animal enclosures, um, thinking about the various properties that are needed in order to keep them safe and protect them from the weather, protect plants from in insects, protect them from being flooded and uh, rotting from too much water and various other things that can be built into the design process around food and fiber. Another aspect is looking again at how different plants and animals are produced in different countries. Um, and then looking at maybe why um, in Asia, for example, most of the staple foods come from rice, whereas in Australia, most of it comes from wheat. Why is that the case? The fact that there's a lot more rainfall and low lying areas and flat areas in Asia whereas in Australia it's much drier and more conducive to growing of wheat than growing of um, uh, rice. They could look at how different um, fibres in terms of plant and animal fibres are produced in Australia. Uh, for example, looking at plantation timbers versus rainforest timbers or plantation timbers versus bamboo production and how they produce different types of fibres and use for different purposes. So have a look now at another little video clip. This one looking at the benefits of having your own school garden and having students create their own food and fibre products um, locally. Okay, so hopefully you've been able to see um, an example of food and fiber production done at school. And certainly most of our primary schools now in Australia are use, using local gardens um, that the students manage and harvest the produce from and often incorporate into their school lunches. Okay, so in years three and four, Again, students will be focused on looking at healthy eating strategies. 
Um, one approach could be looking at how First um, Nation Australians uh, maintained a balanced diet by eating seasonal foods. And they traveled around a lot following um, various song, song lines and food production um, sources where they gathered food on a seasonal basis. Okay, please ignore the barking dogs. So another aspect that could be explored. So another aspect students need to look at is how we produce food to ensure that it's safe um, and healthy for us. So for example, the pasteurization processes for milk, where it's heated and cooled and made safe in terms of removing all the potential bacteria that could exist in raw milk. Um, but also looking at things such as how we can freeze or dry food and how that can um, maintain its longevity. So um, in terms of the nutrient content and also to reduce food wastage and spoilage from fresh produce. Another activity you could do with your students is looking at nutritional aspects of food um, using various um, uh, nutritional guides and also product labeling in terms of nutritional facts on products, um, calculating the nutritional value of various foods and different meals and working out which meals and which foods are healthier based upon their nutritional compositions. And that will be one of the activities you'll be doing for your tutorial. Another aspect students could do is look at how we can make food more enticing and um, more appealing in terms of us wanting to eat it. And that can be done in a whole range of ways, but one of the ones we often do with younger students is around presentation. Um, making little stories out of the food and shapes and animals and things of that nature. But in later years, they can look at other aspects of presentation in terms of taste and texture and smell, um, things of those involving all five senses in terms of making it as um, enticing as possible for us to eat things that we wouldn't necessarily eat, uh, but are healthy for us. Um, extending that idea, looking at um, exploring the range of different senses that we can use to draw from our foods, how different foodstuffs um, feel differently, taste differently, obviously, but also smell differently, um, can also sound differently. Uh, so there are a range of different things that we can explore around the properties of foods. Then coming into years five and six, again, we start by looking at food and fiber production again, this time in managed environments. So again, looking at how First Nation Australians had various approaches to managing their food production, um, and in particular how various locations were the focus of different foods. Um, so bunya nuts, um, up in sort of central Queensland, around Kingaroy, was a, a major source of bunya nut food. And there were areas where macadamia nuts were um, more popular. You could also look at uh, finger limes. So these are sort of three uh, very commonly cultivated foods, but there's many, many others. Students could experiment with how they go about cultivating themselves and the different tools and approaches they use for preparing the soil um, and the effect that has on uh, plant growth. So they could design their gardens and composting systems and mulching systems and various other ways of uh, maintaining their own productive um, food production processes. Students could describe the relationship between plant types and animal breeds around environmental sustainability. So in particular, say selecting what plants to grow in particular locations or particular times of the year. Um, why is it that 
in North Queensland, we have certain plants that grow really well, while in southern parts of Australia, um, different plants grow better and different animals are um, grown better, uh, in, de develop better. Uh, for example, sheep like colder weather much more than they like very hot tropic northern weather. Another thing that we introduce is the idea of uh, paddock to plate and fibre to garment um, production chains. And a new term is gene to plate. Um, of course, now we're using a lot more genetic modification. But the idea that there is a whole series of steps that uh, food and fibre has to go through from where it's primarily produced through a whole series of transportation processes and production processes and then retail processes before it eventually ends up um, at homes. So looking at those different processes and supply chains is another activity you can do with your students. You could take your students to a farm and have them look at how different fibres and plants and animals are being produced. And there's also virtual farm visits available. Um, either through videos and websites, but also um, some virtual reality tours that are possible as well. So a whole range of different ways of engaging students with their understanding of where food and fibre comes from, particularly for students in urban and city-based um, schools where they may not have uh, very much of an idea of these processes. Okay, so now I have another look at another little video looking at agriculture and education from a teacher's point of view. Okay, such so as another approach around the importance of um, agricultural education within design and technology and within the technologies learning area and for students overall. So now let's look at years five and six. So again, we're looking at their healthy eating habits, um, but also looking at what characteristics of foods influence their selection, but also their preparation that make us more likely to engage with healthy eating. So looking at how Aboriginals used various techniques for uh, maintaining the nutritional value of their food and stopping it from spoiling and things of that nature. While they predominantly ate uh, fresh foods, there were some techniques around transporting and uh, preserving foods that they were utilising. You can look at the Australian Dietary Guidelines and have students explore what the what is expected um, in terms of a healthy eating um, process. Now these guidelines are a little bit more technical, so they involve some graphs and some data analysis and things of that, that nature, but students can explore their own, um, say, lunches, their own meals in terms of their nutritional values and the dietary guidelines that the, is recommended that they should follow in terms of maintaining healthy eating habits. Students can experiment with various tools and equipment and ingredients and techniques to design and make their own foods. And this is probably the more design-based um, pro, uh, production process um, active activities within technology education. And you'll be doing one of these activities in your tutorial where you'll be designing and making ice cream. Healthy ice cream. <laughs> so, there are different approaches though you can explore with your students, such as uh, freeze drying or air drying or sun drying, uh, pickling, fermentation. Uh, don't want to go too much in that one, but also different ways of preserving foods so that they don't spoil. You could look at with your students how different foods have got different tastes and why. How we have sour, salty, sweet and spicy foods and human flavors and so there's a range of different flavors that are achieved in foods 
And you can look at how that is again done in various cultural groups. Um, so looking at Asian foods versus Western foods versus indigenous foods. You could have your students do some data collection around uh, food choices and preferences, um, and then analyze those around healthy eating habits. You could get, take your students to various food production pro, um, locations, such as visiting a fast food um, uh, food store uh, versus a restaurant versus a, a cafe uh, versus their school tuck shop, and looking at how different um, organizations prepare and engage with food production in different ways. Okay, so that's years five and six around uh, food specializations. Now, of course, we have our um, production and our processes, the way we go through actually teaching students about how food is, or how the design process works. Again, in years one and two, we don't focus on investigating and defining, but in we do start with generating and designing. So students can generate various designs around their food and fibre production. So for example, communicating their ideas around using different um, uh, cloths for creating finger puppets and incorporating various design ideas based upon the colours and shapes and textures of these various uh, aspects of cloth. They can describe their results um, of their surveys around students' preferences or, on food and collect and do taste tests and um, explore collecting data around what people like in terms of their food or fiber. Then they need to go through a process of producing and implementing step so they could practice various um, techniques such as cutting, if they're going to be doing food preparation or shoveling or mulching, watering. These are technical skills that students will need to learn. Then they need to go through an evaluation stage. Um, so evaluating and looking at alternatives, looking at the potential environmental impact, looking at packaging, looking at ways of using other types of containers instead of having everything individually packaged with throwaway plastic packaging. They can look at the challenges of creating nutritional snacks. Um, so for example, growing their own food, which is probably the, the least impactful, um, through to designing various structures for um, containing their food, so making their own lunch boxes, um, through to designing various nutritional snacks and making sure that their selection of materials in terms of the food stuffs that they're using provide a nutritional well-balanced meal. There's also going to be opportunities for them to collaborate and manage these design processes. So for example, um, using storyboards and charts to plan out when they're going to plant various um, uh, foods. So when, is, when are they going to plant radishes or carrots or lettuces? And they can also look at some of the indigenous planting cycles or, or different calendars that are available. So different ways of working out when is best to plant different um, produce. They could look at the different steps and processes and flow charts and procedures for making products and describe those and particularly describing them for other students to be able to make. So for example, the steps in making a salad or making an ice cream um, or a pizza, various recipes. But it could also be how to water the garden or how to um, put do, doing the compost, doing the mulching. They could take on various roles within their groups so, for example, making food items for a school fete. Someone could be involved in decorating the food items. Someone could be involved in mixing them. Someone could be involved in um, adding the water. Someone could be involved in making the signs. There could be a whole range of different roles that they could take on in preparing, uh, particularly a production line process, 
around producing um, items for sale at a school fete. Then looking at years three and four, we step things up a little bit, but it, we start now at investigating and defining. So looking at the production of local products again, but the idea of having to keep things hot. Um, so if they're again at a school fete and they're um, selling food, but that food can't be allowed to go cold. So what different ways could we come up with for keeping the food hot? It could be we just bring out small amounts at a time and keep the rest in the kitchen and um, cook it only when we need it. Or we could have little burners that keep things warm. There could be a range of different ways, or we could use various insulated um, packaging to keep the foods hot. But um, young students can explore different approaches for that particular problem. They could look at different ways of making things. So for example, joining fabric in different ways. So if they're making, um, say, a t-shirt, how are they going to join the two halves of the t-shirt together? Are they going to sew it? Are they going to use safety pins? Are they going to glue it? They could staple it. Um, they could pin it. There can be various different approaches. What are the advantages and disadvantages to these different approaches for joining materials together? Then in generating and designing their solutions, they could look at how they're going to um, show their designs um, and a design and technology project booklet or poster is a common approach. Um, they could blog their design processes, particularly if they're working in groups. So sharing what they do each day, um, they might share that with their families, with their peers. They might report to their teacher and, and classmates where they're at each lesson so that um, Everyone knows how they're progressing. They need, of course, to think about safety and the different safety by design aspects that they can build into their solutions. So for example, thinking about food safety, what foods might people be allergic to? That's a big thing nowadays. Um, they could also think about signage, how to put up signs, letting people know when they're using the hot, hot plates. Um, various other aspects that can be incorporated into their design thinking when they think about producing their products as to make sure that it's going to be safe. If they're producing hot food, letting people know that it's going to be hot. Um, if they're using, say, boiling water, letting people know that there's boiling water in use. So different ways of incorporating safety aspects. Then, of course, they need to produce and implement their solutions. And that will often involve using tools and equipment accurately, so measuring accurately, cutting accurately. Um, these are things that students need to practice and learn about. They need to be able to select and use their materials and equipment and everything else so that it has a, a minimal impact upon the environment. So um, ensuring that they don't waste a whole lot of material that they don't use a whole lot of materials that have lots of packaging. Maybe they buy a, a big container of seeds rather than lots of small containers of seeds that would have individual packaging. So these are again things that need students need to explore and think about as they come up with their design solutions to various problems. Then of course they need to evaluate. So looking at the design criteria that they've come up with at the start and whether or not they've met that criteria. Did their design solution um, achieve what they wanted to, to achieve? So in, that, in this case, coming up with e-textiles, which are um, toys that students create with cloth that has digital aspects into it, like lights or sound effects or uh, various things that occur as a result of interactions with the, um, the cloth-based toy. They can reflect upon, again, whether or not their design criteria has been met. Um, have they met the needs of the person or community or uh, client that they have created and designed their solutions for? Uh, in this case, looking at reusable bags or um, shopping bags and how it may be better to design those for different community groups. Um, 
Indigenous groups may want a particular indigenous pattern on their backs. Young children might want um, superheroes on their backs. Girls might prefer different colours and um, designs on their bags to boys. So there can be various different styles and approaches that they can think about how to meet the needs of others in their design solutions. Then, of course, they'll be involved in some collaboration and management. Um, particularly thinking about mass production. If they're going to have to make a hundred pizzas, that's quite different to making a single pizza. How would they go about doing that differently? What things can they do to improve efficiency? Assigning roles, assigning steps and stages. Um, and they can develop flow charts and processes to improve those aspects of the production cycle. They'll of course need to investigate and define their potential solutions. So in this case, looking at First Nation um, fibers as sources for commercial solutions, um, making sure that the rope bangles are biodegradable, are using native plant material in their production. Um, these are things that they could consider around the sustainability aspect of their design solutions. They could survey and find out what actually people want and need rather than just making a product and solution and hoping that it's then meeting a need, but going out and finding out what the actual need is from the people that are going to be affected by that um, solution. They could look at how different approaches have been done to meeting that need, um, looking at, um, say, sustainable uh, food production and looking at how um, some communities have developed uh, vertical gardens and hanging gardens and roof gardens and other approaches to just doing the standard um, garden in the backyard or in the back of the school. So there can be a range of different approaches that they can explore and investigate in order to find different ways of approaching their particular design solution. And of course, they should be looking at ways of minimizing uh, material use and waste and how we can uh, repurpose uh, materials. So for example, um, creating soup out of food scraps rather than buying um, soup uh, from, from supermarkets uh, from scratch. So there can be different ways of recycling and reusing and repurposing materials that students can explore. Okay, so now I have a look at another little video clip looking at a particular form of food production, which is around aquaponics. Okay, so that was an example of how one school is being very innovative in doing a food production garden type uh, activity, but incorporating also the production of uh, fish and using the fish uh, waste to fertilize their gardens and increase their yields from their produce. Okay, then in years five and six, Again, start with generating and designing. I'm not sure we already started with investigating, but um, so in generating and designing, they could explore how they can come up with their different solutions. So designing various gardens and working out where they could place things. Um, these are being done on graph paper, but it's also computerized garden design tools, um, making them where they can move different shapes around and try out different design and layouts. It's another approach. But the idea is for them to explore a whole range of options and then make a selection based upon the properties of those different options as to which is the best approach that they should adopt for their solution. In producing and implementing, um, again, they should make choices between the different materials, tools, equipment, and techniques for the specific tool or specific things that they need to do. Um, so if they're going to have to dig some soil out, what's the best tool for digging? 
um, if they're going to have to water the plants regularly, what's the best way of doing that? Going around and using a watering can, or they could set up a sprinkler system, or they could have a drip um, watering system where they use little bottles and put them into the, into the soil next to the plant to apply a drip feed. There can be a range of different ways of approaching the solutions to that problem and students need to explore those different approaches and compare and contrast them and make a decision on which is the most effective. Um, that can extend to a whole range of different work practices um, such as looking at hygiene and food, food safety and environmental considerations and nutritional considerations. For example, different ways of washing um, their produce, um, ensuring the, the selection of their different food products are safe for all the different consumers, um, whether or not there's any allergies or um, and things of that nature that are going to be uh, problematic in what they are producing. Then, of course, they need to go through an evaluation process. Um, so again, looking at their design criteria and what's going to be um, suitable in terms of the equipment and materials and tools that, that they're going to use for what they need to achieve. So in this case, it's an activity of making beeswax wraps. So taking cloth and um, infusing beeswax into that so that it is more useful in wrapping up foodstuffs. And of course, they'll be doing some collaboration and managing, uh, coming up with different um, deadlines and tools to assist them in taking on various roles and meeting various um, stages of their projects. And there are a range of electronic tools for this, but there's also just um, more traditional charts and um, graphs and so forth that students need to come up with efficient ways of managing their time and resources. Okay, so let's look at a final video. This is at the importance of food and fiber production for Australia and indeed for the world and some of the advances that are occurring in this space. Okay, so hopefully you've been able to see what the CSIRO has been doing for the last hundred or so years and coming up with different ways of improving our agriculture in Australia. Okay, so in the tutorial this week, got an activity to do as usual before the tutorial, and this is counting your nutrition. So looking at everything that you eat over a 24 hour period and calculating out how many calories, fat and carbohydrates you are consuming within that 24 hour period. And then post, a, or so you don't post a photo or video of your ice cream, um, post onto Teams and into Linear Griffith um, details of what you've uh, consumed over that 24 hour period. And in the tutorials, you're going to be making ice cream. So for online students, you'll need to gather up the resources needed to do this, uh, primarily cream and icing sugar and other things. Um, you'll find their details on the course website and you'll find a number of videos with instructions on how to go about making your ice cream. So your tutors will assist you through this process. But the idea is to try to create some healthy ice cream and to experiment with different approaches. Now, probably you don't want to experiment too much with the basic components of the ice cream, but in terms of the flavoring and the textures and the additional items that you add to the ice cream, that's where most of your experimentation will be. And share a photo or video of your um, created ice cream onto Teams and Learning at Griffith. And for the students on campus, this will be the equipment you have available. Uh, for the online students, you'll need to have um, cream and caster sugar and ice cubes and rock salt. They're the four basic ingredients. You'll also need some plastic um, sealable bags and you'll then use that to make the basic ice cream. 
and then you will flavor it with what you have available. It might be bits of fruit or chocolate or cocoa powder or flavored syrups, um, etc., to assist with that. The blender is for um, mixing the additional ingredients to add to the ice cream. You don't need a blender, you can just crush it up. Um, that's fine. The other myths are, of course, it can get very cold. Uh, the idea of using the salt and the ice is that the salt makes the ice much colder. Now, really important step, don't add the ice into the bag with the ingredients of your ice cream. The, the salt goes into the, um, the bag with the ice and then a separate bag goes in with the cream and the caster sugar and, the, and into the bag that contains the um, ice and the rock salt or the salt, it can be any salt. Um, and then you can add your other ingredients in at any stage in the process. So I enjoy, I look forward to seeing your ice cream productions. And that's it for this week.